Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Contemporary Art Museum, St. Louis. This is really exciting. This is our second in-person artist talk. <laughs> I know, it's very exciting. COVID has made us appreciate this even more. Um, and I'm thrilled tonight that Shara has flown from New York to be here with us in St. Louis for us to do this artist talk. Um, I'm going to start a little with some formalities and then we'll kind of dive right into a conversation um, and then I'll turn it over to you all. Um, so be percolating about your questions. You don't have to enter them into the chat box or the Q&A. You can ask them in person by raising your hand and getting a mic. So, we're here tonight on the occasion of Shara Hughes On Edge, which you can see in the galleries. Uh, it opened last month here at CAM. Um, I want to start with saying that, of course, like all our exhibitions at CAM, we have many people to thank uh, in order for these exhibitions to happen. Um, so, uh, Shara Hughes On Edge uh, is generously supported by Anne and Joel Enrakratz, Don and David Lenhart, Fern and Leonard Tesler, James and Caitlin Langer, Kathy and Jonathan Miller, Carol Server and Oliver Frankel, and Cindy and Howard Rachofsky. We have special thanks to Rachel Offner Gallery. And of course, big thanks to Shara for making the work and sharing the work with us. Um, I want to start with introducing Shara's biography a little bit to give you a sense of her background. Um, so Shara earned her bachelor's uh, in fine arts from the Rhode Island School of Art and Design and later attended the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. Uh, she uh, most recently had solo shows at the Aspen Art Museum, uh, Le Consortium in Dijon, France, and the Garden Museum in London. She has had many exhibitions and participated in many group shows, including places such as the Drawing Center in New York, Mass Mocha in Massachusetts, the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. Um, her work is hanging at the Metropolitan Museum of Art now in one of their collection exhibitions. Um, and her work belongs in many prominent museum collections, uh, including our very own St. Louis Art Museum. And we're excited to say that um, I believe that work painting will be hung uh, in the next couple of months, so you'll be able to go see their uh, painting of Shara's in their collection. Um, the Dallas Museum of Art, Denver Museum of Art, the Jorge Perez Collection in Miami, uh, the Metropolitan, as I mentioned earlier, um, as well as the Phoenix Art Museum, the Smithsonian. I could go on, and there are also many international collections. So um, we're just so excited to be able to present this exhibition here um, at CAM. I also want to say that in our audience, I don't want to embarrass her, but it's Shara's mom, Patty, and I'm sure you're very proud, and we're so excited that you flew here to be with us tonight. <laughs> Sorry to embarrass you. <laughs> um, so as I said, we're here on the occasion of this exhibition, um, and uh, this is really your first kind of large-scale museum solo exhibition. Um, and in a way, we approached it, as we talked about this show, as a kind of mini retrospective. I mean, it's not a full retrospective, but it's a mini retrospective. And the show includes works from 2015 up until works that you made uh, just in this last year. Um, and so for me, it's exciting that we could bring all these works together for, especially for our public, so that people can see the way that your work has evolved over time. Um, and to be able to have work side by side from say 2016 and 2020, you know, to see the way in which you might be thinking about the work. Um, and so I wanted to start tonight by asking you, what is the significance of having an exhibition of this kind sort of at this moment in your career? Um, yeah, hello, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I, um, it's always funny working on shows like this. Um, and again, this is like definitely one of my first times doing it. So um, I think we first approached it by looking through one of my catalogs of like, uh, I think from paintings from the past five years almost, and kind of like dog-earing several of them. And for me, I was kind of like, this is your job. Because <laughs> I can't really decide like which ones are my favorites. I'll just kind of like reminisce. Um, instead of like actually making solid decisions. Um, so we really collaborated on it from the beginning, which was super helpful. Um, but I think what's so exciting about it for me is that seeing paintings hanging next to each other that are from 2015 and 2020 and having a 
similar approach but completely different result was so exciting for me. There's one wall in there that's hanging, um, two paintings that are, I think, 2015 and 2020. Um, this one here. And totally made at different times in my career. The one on the right was 2015. And that one, um, I think, was one of the first times I was sort of starting with the landscapes. So I was really working my way through what that, what a landscape meant to me and why was I making these. And then the one on the left, 2020, um, was focusing on flowers. But at the same time, like, you can see that the very top sections of them have similar kind of ideas with the way that the marks are kind of mimicking each other. So a lot of times, even with the curating and hanging of the show, these kind of like gorgeous moments really surprise me. And I love being re-surprised by my own work in lots of ways, and especially revisiting old works um, and being able to find them out in the world and bring them back together. It's like having a mini reunion at the same time. So it's, it's super important for me. I feel like I'm still learning about the work. Um, so I love that. I, I feel like I'm subconsciously kind of repeating things. Um, even though in my head I try to not repeat anything, but being able to see that I'm repeating it, but in a completely different way is really important. Yeah. Well, I admittedly, when we first started, I think my original checklist had like 60 paintings on it because I just <laughs> couldn't decide. Um, I mean, I think if anything, like if I had to like choose one word to describe you, I would say prolific. I mean, the number of paintings you make and you can recognize some of the similarities, you know, with how you might uh, approach something. But, you know, to me, everyone is so individually unique. Um, so it was definitely hard to, to be like, how do we like, you know, bring this, we can't have 60 paintings, you know? <laughs> um, but it kind of, I think what happened really when we, we started to look at how to shape the show, we were kind of thinking about the sort of moment of 2015. So I kind of want to talk a little bit about, you know, how did you start making paintings in general, because you've been making paintings for a long time, and then how did you kind of get to making the paintings that you're making now? And I know 2014 is kind of a, a pivotal moment in your in your practice. Do you mm -hmm. want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So um, the work that I was making leading up to 2014, 15 was mostly interior spaces, um, and they were mostly based on the narrative. So there, a lot of times the title would even come first and then I would kind of construct the painting around that. Um, but usually I was sort of um, more directly referencing artists and art history with maybe a painting on a wall or some kind of like um, stylistic approach to a painting that could be a rug within the uh, interior space. And I think during that time I was really trying to learn how to paint. So I was kind of painting like everyone I had learned from, or attempting to, <laughs> um, and then figuring out that that could also be my own style. So learning how to use my toolbox in such a range, wide range, was something I was sort of learning up until, I think, 2014. And I still believe that I'm doing that, but in a different sort of, with a different sort of confidence. Um, so right around 2014, I moved to New York, back to New York. I was living there in 20. 2008 for a little bit, um, and then I, went, I traveled around for a bunch, went to residencies, moved back to Atlanta for a while, um, and then moved back to, tw to New York in 2014 when I was still making these sort of narrative paintings, and there was a brief point where I was adding figures into the work that were more abstract within these interior spaces, um, and I felt like they were getting kind of forced. Um, I felt like I sort of needed a reason to make paintings. Um, and if I didn't have that reason, then I couldn't make something. And that kind of frustrated me because I kind of felt like, why can't, why can't I just believe in myself as a good painter? If I could, I could just make anything like a landscape. Because I didn't really see landscape as something that was that interesting in um, art history. I just figured like actually being in the landscape was more interesting. And you know, if you see someone's trip photos, you're sort of like blah blah blah. Let's see, let's see something more interesting. Um, so that was sort of like a self challenge to me in a way. And I immediately dropped the narrative, dropped figuring out why I needed to make something, and I just started making paintings from nothing. And then that actually really opened me wide open 
Uh, I felt totally free. I finally felt like I could really do what I wanted to do without having a reason. And no matter what, I'm still the one making the painting. So the reason in the, the narrative is still there. It's just not how I begin the painting. So that sort of was like a major shift into the landscapes. Um, so, and the landscapes actually turn into more of like an access point for the viewer to be able to enter in. So that was kind of what we, I think we chose that as like the starting point for the show. Like let's start with 2015 when that shift kind of like occurred. And I, I love that story, I've heard you tell it before, but I love that story because in a way it's sort of like this, this sort of accidental challenge that like changed the course of your practice. And now you make these paintings and um, you know, they're, they're landscape paintings because we have to like give things genres and you know but you often say they're not about landscapes at all can you talk about what that means what, what do you mean when you say it's not really about a landscape yeah um it's it's funny because i feel like especially now um everyone needs to name something you're this you're that um i believe in this i believe in that you it's like harder to be in the middle or abstract <laughs> um so i think um using something as wide as landscape to access a viewer to saying, oh, that's a landscape. I, I can I, I identif identify that immediately, then I've already got you. <laughs> and then I'm like adding you, like I'm bringing you into my world with however I wanna, sh I wanna show you what this world might look like to me. And, um, and so I think that sort of was helpful for me because again, for me, it was also an access point oh, I'm just making a landscape. It doesn't have to be about anything. And then it turns into this like um, psychological kind of space um, that I completely make up. So it tells me about where it's gonna go and where it ends up. Um, maybe I'm thinking about a relationship at the time and it turns into like two flowers kind of strangling each other and then, um, or, or loving each other <laughs> or both. Um, or maybe it's like um, a twisted landscape that, or a wave painting that um, feels almost completely abstract, but has a lot of tension and energy that's more about like clashing and crashing. And maybe that's something that I'm thinking about in my life that's totally connected to me, but it can also still just be a wave painting. So being able to kind of access both like the psyche and then also just it being a painting is really important for me. I wanna pick up on something you said a little earlier um, when you made a reference to art history. So I think, um, you know, your work, um, your prolific practice is, is definitely going to be like part of our art historical canon for this, you know, time that we live in. And you're definitely engaged in these sort of art history, this the, the ongoing art historical conversation around painting. Um, I remember when I visited your studio, you had a lot of art history books. Um, what is your relationship to art history and how do you see your work in relation to that? Are there particular artists that you often go to look at? Do you go look at a lot of art and museums? What is the relationship there for you in relation to the, the way that you work in the studio? Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at paintings all the time. Um, and sometimes I do take breaks so that I'm not he too heavily influenced by someone um, that I'm looking at it at a lot of so um, it's definitely important to me to be able to have some kind of reference in some way but I don't think that there's any heavily reference enough within my like broad range of paintings that you can say oh you make this kind of painting just like a little bit newer um, so it's important for me to be able to be well versed in it um, but also to be able to step away and let myself kind of like ignore that and make my own thing and then if somebody else has a reference that comes in that I don't even know I love that you know it's I completely embrace that um, you know they're all paintings so there's going to be a reference no matter what we're all using oil paint or acrylic so um, I think it's important to me and I'm I'll look at, you know, I'll go to a figure show, like the, I think the last 
really impressive figure show was an Alice Neal show at the Met. I don't know if it's still up, but I, the whole time I was in there, I wanted to get out and stay in at the same time. I wanted to get out to go to my studio because I just kept having all these ideas. But you, typically I wouldn't go to a, you wouldn't think I'd go to a figure painting show and come home and make land, landscapes. So I'm really just um, totally influenced by painting in all ways. So um, I might look at, you know, a completely abstract, minimalist painting and be like those are the colors and come back and make a painting that's completely different colors it's just like that almost intuitive spark that i like to have that kind of catapults me into my own thing and you've you've talked about the the fact that your paintings are not um, depictions of real places um, but um, they are sort of, they come to you as you make them. So can we talk a little bit and share with people, what is the process for you of making a painting? If, if it's not like, because I know you don't start with a sketch, I know that you aren't like making a painting of a place you've been. Mm -hmm. So how do you start and what does that process look like for you? Yeah, so I start, um, there isn't really a, complete system because I keep trying to talk my way out of a system in lots of ways. So I start really abstractly, usually on the floor, and um, I will, you know, pour paint, scrape paint, um, just kind of move colors on the surface um, for, you know, maybe a day or two, and then I'll put it on the wall. And sometimes when it goes on the wall, I know immediately where it will go. Um, and then other times I'll sit with it for like a week just staring at an abstract painting and not be able to figure out exactly where it's going. But from at some point, something in my head will kind of click and then I'll see one thing and then that will just sort of unfold into the rest of the painting. Um, now sometimes I, I have a show that was just up in Zurich and that was a sun painting show. So sometimes I'll have a theme, um, but it'll be pretty loose. The sun idea was more just like formal circle, how do I make this, how do I stretch something that's so hard to stretch as a circle um, into a, a whole other language in lots of different ways to see the sun in different ways. So um, so I will come up sometimes with a theme, but it'll, it'll, it's loose. And you've described the process of working on your paintings as intuitive. What does that, what does that mean to you? What does that, how, like, how do you know, you, you, you sort of said, like, I let the painting tell me what to do, and sometimes we get in a fight, and, yeah. you know, can you describe a little bit about, like, what that looks or feels like when you're making a work? Yeah, um, it's unpredictable and predictable at the same time in lots of ways, so I'll set up these problems, like the abstract start, and then um, I'll... And that's very intuitive and something that I'm not thinking about. I'm not, th I'm thinking about like, oh, what do I have to do the laundry tonight? I have to do this, you know. And I think that's sort of, it, it gives me sort of like an access point to um, just for working formally. And I think intuition with color has become something really important to me as well. I don't ever mix palettes or come up with a plan at all before. A lot of times I'll just go directly on with the paint out of the tube on the canvas and even mix it on the canvas um, or not. So I think it's just a feeling um, and I maybe like almost like a nervous tick, <laughs> like almost like cleaning your room until you're done or, um, or until you're okay with it not being that way. So even when I'm finishing a painting, I think I'll, I'll kind of have it on the wall for a while and I'll sit with it until, and maybe I'll start something else, but if it's in my view and I'm kind of subconsciously sort of fixing it with my eyes, it's not done. If I can live with it and um, not keep like going to one area and feeling like it's unfinished, then, you know, then it's not finished. So, um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's how it works. I never really totally know. <laughs> I feel like you have like a relationship with each painting, you know, like yes. that it's sort of like you're figuring it out and it's figuring you out or something like that. Yeah, and it's it's funny because some of the, the ones that I struggle with the most are, um, yeah, turn out the best in some ways because um, I'm not, I'm not falling into a pattern. It's more like, oh, I thought I knew how to do this and I messed up, so now I have to figure this out. And then it's like, oh, I actually learned something else. Yeah. Um, so it's never really like, and now I do this, and now I, it's not like, right. 
you know. It's not formulaic. I remember, yeah. too, there was a piece that you showed me in your studio, and you were like, this one started with a blue, you know, yeah. layer, <laughs> and there was, like, no blue in the painting, yeah. and it was complete. <laughs> so it's interesting, too, that it, like, really evolves over time. Yeah, I think, like, the minute I try to plan something, it feels like I'm just producing a painting. I'm not actually being a painter. So, like, if I, same with, with a, if I started with the sketch first, then that's the idea already. So why would I do it again? So I think like being very um, involved in what's happening moment to moment, that keeps me interested. And I think that reflects within the paintings, the energy and sort of like, I'm figuring it out with you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's the reason why I don't do any sketches beforehand too. So uh, I thought we could also talk a little bit about the scale of your paintings. So um, if you've had a chance to walk through the galleries, you know that many of them are, most of them are quite large. And you've talked a little bit about, in the past, about how you work at sort of your, your physical wingspan. Um, but most of them are quite big. And then there are some that are small, but like not like, you know, kind of small. They're like much smaller. And um, I think there's something with all of these works that's successful, which is that they really pull the viewer in. Um, how, if you're working intuitively, do you kind of know at what scale you're gonna work? And you know, those decisions, like where do they get made? And then, um, you know, do you do things that are like somewhere in the middle? Or is it like, do you like the kind of extremes of the sizes? Yeah, I, I think I've just naturally always wanted to work large um, with my wingspan and so that I don't need um, help from, I like to just be alone most of the time when I'm working. Um, so scaling down was actually really difficult for me. Um, I didn't want them to feel like, you know, the postcard for the show mm -hmm. um, or like a little souvenir. I wanted them to still have the same amount of energy and when you're in front of it, you still feel large and small at the same time as you would in with a large painting. Um, so actually the smaller ones take me a lot longer to make. They'll sometimes take months where the large ones could take as short as like five days to two weeks, um, a month. So having the smaller ones around all the time, um, I think that I, I keep those mostly like on one wall closer to me um, and subconsciously I'm kind of working on them without touching the canvas. Um, whereas like with the larger ones I can make like a huge gesture and the smaller ones I have to be way more specific and sparse with the mark making um, because I don't, I don't want them to feel overworked or muddy. Um, so I think like being able to spend so much time with them in their process gives them a little bit of um, distance in a way um, and my time with them is longer so it it feels like they still have the same kind of importance as the large ones. So I do like showing them with the large ones, mm -hmm. um, just because I do feel like they can still hold up on the wall with them. Yeah. There's also um, a couple of motifs that kind of appear um, in many of the works. Um, and I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about those. I have a couple slides here that kind of give a few examples, but maybe you can choose a few to talk about. Yeah, I think like when I first started making the landscapes, I was still thinking about the interiors mm -hmm. naturally. So thinking about walls and bringing somebody in. Um, so there's a lot of like kind of, uh, you know, formal aspects of the one on the right has like these two kind of cliff, um, portions and then the one on the left has sort of these two trees that are almost circling the painting um, and then of course the access through the painting in the middle but I think that was generally me kind of trying to still bring the viewer in in such like an expansive thought as landscape which just goes on and on and on so how do I how do I contain this number one so kind of putting these borders and barriers to show you where you are and where things start and begin um, is almost like making three or four pictures in one. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of telling the viewer where they stand. They're behind the tree, they're looking around here, they're up above, they're in the bush. Um, so in that way I'm giving you um, 
a painting within a painting within a painting and then also telling you like look you're invited in you're already in so why don't you just stay and enjoy it in some way so um i think that was the one of the motifs that kind of keeps happening um and then yeah i think i think in some ways too i was thinking about like generally even with portraiture that's like the central figure is in the middle, and then the, the edges just usually kind of go away. And so if I flipped that to where the central part was almost the emptiness going through, and then brought that edges out, it kind of would have the opposite effect. But still kind of feel like maybe you're the per portrait in one way or another. So one of the other things we did in this show is bring in works on paper um, into the exhibition as a way to show a kind of holistic part of your practice, right? You're making paintings, but you're also making these works on paper um, and drawings. So I wanted to ask you if, if you could talk a little bit about your approach in making these works and how the role of working in this medium um, relates to your overall practice. I think when you talk about the paintings and you talk about the sort of intuitiveness and the ability to kind of keep going back and going back, there's a fluidity in that process. Um, I, From what I understand about working um, in this way with works on paper and prints and drawings, there's a little less of that fluidity. Can you talk about, you know, how does that, how do these relate to and how are they part of the larger practice of the making of, of paintings? Yeah, so with the drawings, um, I make those at home usually or on trips, and I don't take I don't usually take them into the studio, or I definitely don't make them there. Um, I kind of set up like a space at home that feels less intimidating. Not that I'm intimidated by my studio, but something that feels more comfortable. I can watch movies. I can kind of relax. I can kind I of. I saw you post a picture on the airplane with like oh, drawings yeah. on your <laughs> yeah on your table. I was like, oh, this is how it's made. Yeah. Well, that time I was traveling for like three weeks, and I was like, <laughs> I need to make something. <laughs> so I needed like that was my like temporary <laughs> studio. <laughs> Um, but I do, I do take them usually on trips and kind of set up if I'm staying somewhere for a while. Um, but usually in a relaxed setting so I can kind of play around with ideas or just subconsciously make marks and then kind of it turns into this kind of stack of drawings that then I'll flip through later and think, um, oh, I should really loosen up in my paintings. This is a good idea. And maybe I'll bring them in, but I won't usually, I never work from them one to one. Um, so it's a good way for me to kind of like relax and be productive, but also kind of surprise myself in a different way. Um, of course, with paper, you can't really go back. So that's something, a, a bigger challenge too. Um, you kind of have to live with your mistakes, um, which can be very uh, informative in lots of ways. Um, and then with the prints, that's a completely other story. Um, those are so much harder to make. Uh, number one, I have to go somewhere else and I have to work with a team, which uh, feels like a lot of pressure when you're not, um, when you're there for a time schedule and you have people waiting on you and helping you um, and you don't have your privacy to sort of be like, oh, I made a mistake, but no one's going to see it. <laughs> so the prints are, um, are very special to me as well because um, they're completely surprising. Um, I always thought when I was first revisiting prints in 2018 that, oh, I can do this, I paint, I paint, I can make print. And then I went into the print shop and was totally humbled by how hard it is. You have to think backwards. The colors that you're putting on get completely, totally skewed when it comes through on the paper. Um, you just have to figure out, you have to retrain yourself another way of thinking. So I think that was really helpful. Um, because I was mad a lot, and then I had some distance from the work, and I came back, and again, seeing them here, too. Um, I really love seeing them with the drawings and the paintings all together, because it's, it's almost like three different struggles. <laughs> And we, you know, we had this conversation about how do we present the works on paper and the paintings. And I remember very early on, you had said, you know, I really want to put them sort of in a separate space because there is often this assumption by visitors or viewers or audiences, probably because of the way we receive information and what we know about art, mm -hmm. that these are 
going to be assumed to be like the sketches or like the work that's done before the paintings. Mm -hmm. um, but that was like the very not that's not at all what they are for you. And so that's why you will all see them in these sort of separated out gallery spaces a little bit so that hopefully they kind of present in that way as works of the, in their own right, really. Yeah. Yeah, I like how you also had the suggestion to bring some of them into the very end of the show um, because it, it does kind of give you the warm up area of like what this like the whole show is going to be like, but then you kind of revisit at the end and realize that, you know, they are separate practices, but they're still in the same, like made by the same person, and they're still as, as important as the other parts. Yeah. Yeah. So I would like to kind of end with one more question, and then we can kind of see what people want to ask you. Um, one of the things I love about... Um, your work is um, the way that you choose titles. And it's interesting because at the beginning of this talk, you said, you know, that when you used to make paintings that were more narrative or subject driven, you started with a title. And um, I, I understand that that's not the case now. Um, but some of the titles, I mean, I was saying this to you before. So one of my favorites is. Um, the painting on the right, I needed a hug, because when I look at this painting, I feel like it's offering me a hug. Um, and so I just thought maybe it would be nice to talk a little bit about how you choose titles, um, and you know, is it sort of, are they reflecting kind of your um, way that you were feeling when you made the painting, or when you look at the painting after it's complete? Um, because they definitely feel like psychological like entry points, you know, like I'll look at one, but then after I read the title and I look at it again, I feel a little different about it. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I definitely think I title them after I make the works and they are reflective of both how I'm feeling, how I was feeling when I was making the work and then how I was feeling afterwards. So, um, you know, sometimes it's, it could be more leaning towards how I'm make how I'm feeling when I'm making the works, but sometimes I don't know really. I'm just sort of making the work, and then um, maybe I get the images a month later, and that's usually when I title things. And then a month later, when I'm out of however I was feeling, I could it like reminds me, and then I'm thinking, oh wow, that was really dark, or this one was really vulnerable, or this one was really excited and happy. Um, so. I, I like to have some distance from it. Um, I'm trying to think which ones we should, I should kind of section Here, out. I'll take you to, uh, I know you wanted to talk about Naked Lady. Oh yeah, this one is called Naked Lady. And um, I remember thinking about, I was making a series of flower paintings at the time. I remember researching um, like what was the most poisonous flower and they all, um, they all just look like beautiful flowers. So it wasn't really that much of a departure from, you know, seeing something that's scary um, and beautiful. So I, I thought about making this painting about a flower that was powerful and large and um, vulnerable at the same time, almost as if this is somebody who's like derobing at the same time, but also like scary and daunting so being able to have the vulnerability of something that's you know naked but at the same time like powerful and um, dominant in this in the same way so I feel like with this especially with the flower series I was making I was trying to figure out a way to kind of change the the idea of flowers as not being just beautiful um, but they can be scary and they can be soft and they can be um, you know powerful but also shy. Um, so that painting, that's where that painting came from. Um, and there's other titles like, um, uh, I think, that give you sort of a little suggestion as to what the work is about, but doesn't really kind of close the sentence. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm not giving you a paragraph of like, this is what this all means, and this is why I was thinking it. It's sort of like, I'm gonna give you like a little snippet, and then you can finish the sentence if you want to. Mm -hmm. But also, it can stand on its own without the title as well. Um, I'm very aware of not being able to do a talk with every single painting I make. Um, thankfully, so I think that's, <laughs> that's like kind of, a, it, 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 it's just sort of a suggestion to how, to into my world, but also like it, it can still be by itself. 
Yeah, and sometimes they reference, like, when you read it, you think it's making a reference to the composition. So, you know, I think it was with, uh, with Peep Show, which is mm -hmm. the painting on the left, you know, where that has so many different ways that you can think of it, right? Yeah. Like, Peep Show, Peep Show, Peep Show. <laughs> Am I peeping through the You know, there's yeah. so <laughs> many layers to it. So yeah. it's, it's interesting that you offer this kind of open-endedness that I think, just like the compositions do something to bring you in, I think the title does the same thing. You know, it kind of yeah. like has this like hook that's trying to bring you into the painting. Yeah, and it can be playful at the same time. You know, it can be something that's almost a pun, but also like kind of dark at the same, you know, it could be funny and like maybe not that nice at the same time. Like yeah. the one on the left is, I love you, I love you not. Yeah. Um, and that actually took me a while to figure out the title on that one, just because I was like, what, what, what is this painting turning into? And then it had these kind of like, you know, petals that were falling off. And I was like, oh, is it crying or is it like shooting daggers at me? I guess it's like, <laughs> I love you, I love you not. And that's sort of maybe how I felt when I was making the painting too. Like, is this going to work out? <laughs> Great. Well, I think this is kind of a good moment to open it up to the audience um, and just see if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask. If you um, have a question, just raise your hand and my colleague Michelle is going to bring you the microphone. Hi. I love your work. <clears throat> um, I'm, I have a question about your canvases. Like when you have them made or if you, do you stretch them yourself or do you have them made? Um, I depends on the size. Mm -hmm. um, I'll usually put the smaller ones together. Um, it's cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> and then do you do you like have a, a lot of blank canvases stacked up to work on, or do you do it painting by painting? Yeah, it it kind of depends on you know what what I have coming up. Um, but I definitely usually have something ready to go in the studio, but I only work on one painting at a time, except for the smaller ones, which are always sort of around. Um, but I will um, usually have the stretchers, if they're larger made, and then I'll stretch them myself. Um, but that's starting to get uh, <laughs> tedious. <laughs> so, <Thanks>. yeah. <laughs> when did you first decide that you wanted to be an artist. Should we ask my mom? <laughs> mom? No, I won't, I won't put her under that. <laughs> um, well, I have three older brothers, and so I was left out a lot. So, <laughs> so I think probably like the independent play that I had to do a lot was um, helpful, going to all their baseball games and sitting in the bleachers. Um, but I guess like, Sometime during high school, I was um, I started taking classes at um, the Atlanta College of Art, which was like while I was in high school, I was taking classes at a college, a uh, community college, community college, I think, um, and that was sort of like the test, the test to see if I could do it and if I was still interested. And then I. I applied to um, some art schools, and that was sort of the second test to see if I could get in. And I got in early to a, a, an art school that I, a, the first art school I wanted to go to. And so that was sort of like, I guess, I guess this is, this is what I should do. But I don't know if like knowing I'm an artist happened until like after I graduated from art school and um, maybe had like a few shows and then. Um, I feel like the outside validation helped, but like knowing you're an artist kind of comes in a different kind of wave, you know? I mean, you know, there's days that I'm like, I'm done. I don't think I'm an artist anymore. <laughs> so, um, tricky question, but um, I think it was always sort of in there. It's just sort of like uh, how, to, how to tap in and believe in yourself in that way. I noticed that in some of your pictures, it appears as though you're working on a raw canvas, and in others where you achieve a very thick impasto, it looks as though it's prepared in a different way. So do you have a uniform way in which you prepare the canvas, or is that also kind of an intuitive part of the process? Yeah, that's a great question that I forgot to mention. Um, I start all of them on raw canvas, um, and that it does change, so sometimes I'll, I'll prepare the canvas with gesso or like a layer of colored 
um, colored acrylic over the entire thing flat. Um, but a lot of times, like working with the raw canvas, I can do something that I can't do when it's um, when I'm turning it into oil because the oil reacts differently. Um, so I usually work with water-based paint first, whether it's dye, acrylic, um, some kind of a gesso. But that that also helps me work really quickly. And eventually, that raw canvas will usually get covered with something so that it's more archival and so that it stays better but at the end what you're seeing the end product is like 90 percent oil even if i've started with acrylic or some other kind of water-based paint first it's usually like just a starting position and then i'll kind of like work through it so notice in many of the pieces in this show there's kind of a framing motif using trees or other things was that a intentional thing that you were working on at the time or is it something you've worked with often and kind of you know, what was the purpose behind that? Yeah, so that's sort of um, what I was speaking about when I was kind of talking about this um, sort of framing motif that has come in since uh, when I first started making the landscapes. I was, before that I was doing the interior, so kind of feeling like I needed some kind of a wall or some kind of like an entry point for the viewer. So kind of exaggerating that um, window to my world is sort of like the idea behind that. So kind of giving you an extra kind of um, boundary that you know that you're already in and then realize that you're, you're kind of working your way backwards out from the painting in lots of ways. When I got the email about the show, um, I was intrigued and surprised. Um, you know, the last show here at CAM, I believe, was Stories of Resistance, and this feels like a really different world. You know, key words from this talk seem like affect, psyche, interiority. Um, and so I am thinking about um, what it means to have this pivot for the institution. This is a question both for the curator and the artist. Um, what it means to have this pivot from stories of resistance to um, on edge and um, how you see the show's intention with each other or um, informing each other and how um, this show sort of relates to um, the programming um, at CAM take this one. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, I think that when we think about building a program, um, exhibition program for the museum here, um, you know, one of the challenges that I'm presented with is how to build a balanced program. And um, there are a lot of different ways in which I approach that question, right? Because that can be um, about the content, it can be about the mediums, it can be about the perspectives and points of view. Um, and so, you know, the, the pivot is, um, this is a show that is in line with many other kinds of shows that we do at CAM in terms of um, an artist at a particular point of their career, an artist um, having the opportunity to bring works together that maybe haven't been brought together before, um, but you know, is very different from the last show, which was a group exhibition that was looking at a particular theme um, that I think maybe, I would say that a curatorial kind of um, vision for a group show really is about asserting our voice as curators, and that show was created by myself and um, Amisa Jeffries, our assistant curator, um, as was Shara's show. And so, you know, I think we assert our voice differently with a show like Stories of Resistance than with something like a show where it's really about um, a single artist's um, work. And I think I approach those kinds of curatorial projects differently because for me working on a project like this with Shara, you know, the questions I ask is what kind of show do you need now? What would be helpful to you? You know, as opposed to here I am with my agenda, what are we going to do for Cam? It's like what do you need and how can we as CAM, as part of our mission, meet you and give you the kind of project that would be best for you in your practice at this moment. And then I would say Stories of Resistance, quite different, because it's really about like, you know, Misa and I going, okay, here's a theme we want to talk about. How would we construct an exhibition? Who are the artists? What are the works? And how do we tell that story? Um, so they are different. And I think one of the things that I um, hope for in our program is that we do different things and we bring not just different voices but we approach the curatorial work differently from season to season so that you all have something interesting and different to engage with and connect with over over time I would hope yeah 
Thank you, yeah. I was just curious how uh, being in New York right now informs your practice, because uh, you had mentioned that you moved back there. I was just curious about that. Yeah, um, New York is so different right now. <laughs> um, particularly last year, um, obvious for obvious reasons. Um, I really, I, I actually travel quite a bit, so it was really nice to stay in one space for a long time. So during that period, I made a series of sun paintings, and that was actually towards the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, and that was really reflect in, re reflective on the feeling of um, coming out of 2020. What does that look like? Um, pretty much the same, a little bit right now, but a, a little bit better. We're still sort of like on the on the outs, but um, you know, thinking about. Um, hope and um, how, how scary that feels and how a new day is around the corner, but what does that look like? It's so different now. Um, the idea of the sun is something that like we need and we have to have it. It gives us warmth, it, it, it makes things grow, but we also can't look at it. So it's like we, we need it, but we, we can't have it. So there's this similar feeling with um, how it felt for everyone in the past year and a half now, almost two years. So it's like, um, live, also I'm two blocks from my studio from where I live. So I was very much going back and forth on the same street and how different that felt when you could hear the birds and sirens instead of people and um, cars and you know hustle and bustle of every day. Now it's getting back to normal. But um, so I feel like it was, it was really productive in like a really um, strange, eerie way. Um, so um, generally it's, I mean, I thought it was great in lots of ways too, but um, generally being in New York is great because you have access to so many great shows. Um, you feel the energy of artists all around you, um, also making and creating and the level of motivation is really high. So I, I love being in that environment. It's, it's exhausting, but I like it. Well, before I jump into the question, just wanted to tell you that your works are stunning. They live rent free in my mind. And um, my question is, what do you want the audience to feel when they see your work? Is there like, mm. how should we interpret or should we not interpret them at all? Wow, um, I want them to feel inspired, number one, um, in whatever way that means to everyone. Um, I don't think I really want to create something that feels so closed as like answering a question with like a few options. So um, yeah, I think I just want to say inspired. I think they have an open-endedness that allows for a lot of different ways for people to connect and to react and respond to them. And I think that's what makes them so kind of, um, they have the ability to connect with so many different people, right? And I think that's what you were saying earlier a little yeah. bit about. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, the, I mean, for, for example, the painting on the left is something that happened, like a painting that I made about something that was very specific to me, but I feel like if I told what that was, everyone would have that, that thought to it whenever they came to it. So I'm also very specific about like, you know, if I'm writing a press release or reading a press release of my own, not to mention any other artists, because then that really binds my work to those artists. To, so that's even just another boundary that I, I, I welcome, but I don't really want to give that to you to start with, because then that is what you come to it with it's better if you leave with your own ideas in lots of ways. Yeah, because it limits you from thinking about right. something else. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, I think we might wrap up. Thank you, Shara. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, it's been a lovely evening. And um, I think the galleries are closed for tonight. But please uh, come back and see the show again now that you've heard from Shara. I think you might see the works in new ways. Um, and the exhibition is up uh, until February, so you have plenty of time to come back. So thank you again and have a good evening.